Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Hi, I'm Eddie Glaud. I'm the chair for the Center for African American Studies, and I'm delighted uh, to welcome you to the 2012 Toni Morrison Lectures. Uh, the occasion. This is a lecture sponsored jointly by the Center for African American Studies and Princeton University Press. Uh, the lectures are held annually and spotlight the new and exciting work of scholars and writers who have risen to positions of prominence, both in academe and in the broader world of letters. The lectures celebrate the expansive literary imagination, uh, the intellectual adventurousness and political insightfulness that characterize the writing of Toni Morrison. We're delighted that you've joined us. Uh, the inaugural lecture was given by our own Professor Cornell West, the class of 1943 University Professor of Religion. Uh, the second lecture was delivered by Edwige Dandicott, the author of Brother, I'm Dying, a 2008 National Book Critics Circle Award winner. And in 2009, the Honorable Cory Booker, that hero who just recently dived into a burning building to save someone. Uh, presented his lecture, The Unfinished Journey of America's Spirit. So on behalf of Princeton University, on behalf of President Tillman, uh, the Center for African American Studies, and Princeton University Press, uh, we want to welcome you again. So my charge today, beyond just giving you the occasion, is to introduce the introducer. And so I have the distinct privilege of introducing Professor Daphne Brooks, she is professor of English and African American studies here. She teaches courses on African American literature and culture, performance studies, critical gender studies, and popular music culture. She is the author of two books, Bodies in Descent, uh, Spectacular Performances of Race and Freedom, 1850 to 1910, winner of the Earl Hill Award for Outstanding Scholarship on African American <coughs> Performance, She's also the author, author of Jeff Buckley's Grace, an extraordinary book on Jeff Buckley's amazing career. Brooks is currently working on a new book entitled Subterranean Blues, Black Women and Sound Subcultures from Minstrelsy Through the Millennium. She's the author of numerous articles, the winner of so many awards. She's a master teacher, but more importantly, she's an extraordinary colleague. And it's with that I introduce the amazing Daphne Brooks. Thank you, Dr. Glaude, for those extraordinarily generous words. Um, and thank you to the Center for African American Studies for making this evening possible. It's wonderful to see you all here tonight. I have the distinct honor and privilege of introducing the wondrous Bill T. Jones to deliver the first of three of our annual Toni Morrison lectures. So please bear with me. Uh, such an extraordinary guest we have tonight. Flight, love, desire, risk, danger, desperation, transcendence, vulnerability, wisdom, mercy, compassion, grace, enchantment. Words, themes, philosophical conundrums that we use ring for truths and passionately exhaust time and again when discussing the work of both Toni Morrison and Bill T. Jones. Of the latter term, Professor Morrison offers these reflections in a well-known 1988 interview saying that, quote, my own use of enchantment simply comes because that's the way the world was for me and for the black people that I knew. In addition to the very shrewd, down-to-earth, efficient way in which they did things and survived things, there was this other knowledge or perception, always discredited but nevertheless there, which informed their sensibilities and clarified their activities. She continues, I grew up in a house in which people talked about their dreams with the same authority that they talked about what really happened. They had visitations and did not find that fact shocking. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. And they had some sweet, intimate connection with, the, with things that were not empirically verifiable. Without that, I think I would have been quite bereft because I would have been dependent on so-called scientific data 
to explain hopelessly unscientific things. And also I would have relied on information that even subsequent ob objectivity has proved to be fraudulent. The epistemologies of Toni Morrison's aesthetics consistently challenge us to move between worlds, to question the so-called boundaries of space and time, to actively engage in the ways that history shapes each of us while simultaneously providing us with lessons so that we, we might envision, touch, feel, and celebrate our own futurity like baby Suggs and brethren in the clearing. There are so many ways that we might think of our beloved Professor Morrison as in deep conversation with choreographer, dancer, theater director, writer, activist, genius artist, Bill T. Jones. Consider his words, his own words, in his stunningly moving memoir, which I've had the pleasure and honor of teaching several times, from 1995, entitled Last Night on Earth. Jones reminds us of how, quote, in its beginning, stance was something that we as a community enjoyed it was a way we told our stories. It was a way we expressed what we wanted and what we feared. And it is still a ritual. The dancer and the watcher are held together in a moment. The dancer steps, he pushes the earth away and is in the air. We agree, dancer and watcher, to hold on to the illusion that someone flew for a moment. And in this way, all dance exists in memory. Together, Morrison and Jones mobilize enchantment and flight in the pursuit of history and memory. Like her fiction, her scholarship, and to be sure, her forays into the world of opera and classical music, Bill T. Jones is astounding, mobile, insurgent, and exquisite, abstruse, and inquisitive body of work perpetually enchants, even as it simultaneously agitates for justice, equality, and fugitive forms of self-making. It's no surprise that these two luminaries would work together in 1995 when Mr. Jones directed and performed in a collaborative work with Professor Morrison along with the late great Max Roach at New York's, New York's Alice Tully Hall. Bill T. Jones, born the ninth of 12 children of migrant farm workers, his parents moved from rural Florida when he was three years old and he grew up in Wayland, New York, just south of Rochester. He attended the State University of New York at, at Binghamton where he became interested in movement and dance. There he met Arnie Zane, who became his partner in business and in life, and together the two developed works that tested the boundaries of modern dance, redefined the duet form, and kinesthetically illuminated questions of identity and sociopolitical issues. Mr. Jones choreographed and performed worldwide with his late partner, Mr. Zane, before forming the Bill T. Jones Arnie Zane Dance Company in 1982. Now entering its 30th anniversary season, the Bill T. Jones Arnie Zane Company continues to critically, exuberantly, whimsically, bravely break open new ways of engaging race, gender, sexuality, region, class, and global politics in the world of dance through speed and stillness, through adornment and nakedness, through asymmetry and angularity, through playfulness and dead serious, made you look twice gesture. Some of its most celebrated creations are evening length works, including, I'll just name a couple, for the sake of time, last summer at Uncle Tom's Cabin, The Promised Land, still here, we set out early, visibility was poor, you walk, blind date, chapel chapter, fondly do we hope, fervently do we pray, to name but a few groundbreaking productions. Creating more than 140 works for his own company, Jones has also choreographed for num numerous other companies as well including the Alvin Ailey American Dance Theater, Axis Dance Company, the Boston Ballet. In recent years, he has galvanized and awakened the world of Broadway theater, choreographing the 2006 Broadway musical Spring Awakening, for which he won a Tony Award, and writing, directing, choreographing the electrifying 2009 musical Fela, based on the life of Afrobeat pioneer and Nigerian activist Fela Kuti, nominated for 11 Tonys. Mr. Jones once again received an award for his choreography, one of three that the production won. And as an aside, there are many who believe the show should have won all 11. We could, yes, thank you. Um, we could, in fact, create a full-length opera out of the list of awards and accolades uh, that both Mr. Jones and his company have received for time's sake. I'll close by listing just a few. In addition to the aforementioned Tonys, he is the recipient of the 2010 Kennedy Center Honors, the 2007 Obie Award, and 2006 Stage Directors and Choreographers Foundation Callaway Award for his choreo choreography for Spring Awakening, the 2010 Jacob's, Pillows, Jacob's Pillow Dance Award, the 2007 USA Eileen Harris Norton Fellowship, the 2005 Samuel H. Scripps American Dance Festival Award for Lifetime Achievement, the 2005 Harlem Renaissance Award, 
the 2003 Dorothy and Lillian Gish Prize, and the 1994 MacArthur Genius Award. In 2011, Mr. Jones was named Executive Artistic Director of New York Live Arts, an organization that strives to create a robust framework in support of the nation's dance and movement-based arts through new approaches to producing, presenting, and education. And finally, without a doubt, then it is quite fitting that in 2000, the Dance Heritage Coalition named Mr. Jones an irreplaceable dance treasure. Through his work, he consistently reminds us of what it means to treasure our bodies and to treasure dance. And we are so grateful that he is here with us this week. Please join me now in giving a warm welcome to Mr. Bill T. Jones. Thank you. Thank you. I shall not, I shall not be moved. I shall not, I shall not be moved. Just like a tree standing by the water. I shall not be removed. And I do that because I'm nervous. <laughs> I have prepared this erudite presentation tonight. But the best I can always do at moments like this is remember Estella Jones, who would say, child, when you go out there, you got to step out on the word. The word. For those of us who are not believers in religion, what is the word? Discourse, sharing, love, patience. You remind me of that. And now down to the work. I would like to thank President Shirley M. Tillman, Professor Eddie Glaud, Chairman of the Center for African American Studies, Professor Daphne Brooks, and the Toni Morrison Lecture Selection Committee. And before I begin, there's a short list of things I would like you to know. The lecture pastime is the first of three. When I was invited to deliver these lectures, I thought I wanted to say something, and in fact, I realize now that I wanted to do something. Tonight's lecture does not lead to a conclusion, but is in fact itself a kind of performance. What else can I do? <laughs> the lecture is composed of elements, my thoughts, quotes from John Cage and others, and stories borrowed from 170 stories I have written or compiled for story time. A Bill T. Jones Arnie Zane Dance Company work we premiered this past January at Montclair State University's Kasser Theater's Peak Performance Series. In tonight's lecture, sound designer Sam Crawford and I have improvised a Cajun sound design to assign spatial locations to the above mentioned three elements. Storytime is a meditation on John Cage's Indeterminacy, a 1958 work in which he read 90 stories, each one minute long. Indeterminacy appealed to me because it encapsulates pillars of John Cage's thoughts regarding time, content, intention, non-intention, as demonstrated by chance procedure. Buddhist philosophy within the poetry of performance. Engaging with this seminal work held out the promise, promise of examining, interrogating a system of thought and practice grounded in ideas commonly held by many, myself included, striving to understand how Eastern thought, liberation philosophy, and art could be used to redefine reality for both the maker and his or her audience. What is the nature of an experimental action? It is simply an action, the outcome of which is unforeseen. John Cage, silence. To take another man's idea, to develop it, expand it, to impose on it its logic or super logic, this does imply an element of criticism. Morton Feldman, Bula Bula, 
an essay from Get My Regards to Eighth Street. The new confuses the old. Sometimes they enhance each other. Sometimes they do just the opposite. Manet, for instance, because of the new, no longer looks so unfinished. Morton Feldman. The first time I heard or saw John Cage was in 1972 at SUNY, SUNY Binghamton. How I, a theater dance major, happened to be present there in the student commons of the brand new College in the Woods is a mystery to me 40 years later. I remember the long table at which John Cage sat with, I believe, David Tudor and several other musicians behind a bank of microphones, reel-to-reel -reel tape machines, amplifiers, a profusion of wires, and perhaps a traditional instrument or two. To the left of this table was a rowboat standing on its end. Next to it was a young woman in sweater and blue jeans. The room had been specially wired for sound with some speakers, most of them up near the ceiling. As I remember, the sounds were of nature in constant interactive flux with electronic drones, whirring, whines, tweets, and scraping metallic noise. At one point, one of the musicians ran the microphone round the contours of the boat, as he later did around the mildly embarrassed woman. During the evening, it was described that the microphone was picking up frequencies bouncing off the boat and the woman that fed back into the system, causing a shift of pitch, timbre, and volume in the soundscape all around us as we stood or sat on the floor, chairs, and couches of this common room. Though my focus was on theater and athletics, I had already developed the habit of attending lectures and screenings in the cinema department and was discussing the performance with one of the young filmmakers, an instructor. He said that most striking for him was that amid all the avant-garde soundscaping, there were bird calls where one expected to find them, up near the ceiling. Two impressions stayed with me after the performance. The first was just how bewildering the event had been, and the second was a realization that I had been bored, and yet could not stop thinking about the event for days after. The event taught me that boredom is not a problem in and of itself. I start with this memory as a way into my remarks because the night proved to be a sort of second birth or coming into consciousness of the world, of ideas, or what I choose to call the discourse. I cannot say I was really in the discourse, but more like a newcomer hearing the din and spirited exchanges of a heated debate from an anti -room. At that time, SUNY Binghamton's cinema department was arguably one of the best in the country for experimental cinema and certainly one of the most progressive on the campus. And in this department, I was given an essential concept. Art is an exercise in perception. This exercise of John Cage was probably the most troubling and powerful example of this notion. Though I had come to the university with every notion of being an actor and discovered dance along the way, I believe that that night made it possible for me to realize that performance as art making would be a means by which I could validate my place in the world. To validate. Amid all the hurly-burly of the counterculture with its mind-expanding drugs, music, and various other roads to transcendence, there was unease. Was it race? Was it sexuality? Was it just being young during the Cold War? For whatever reason, I needed a way to understand how to live in this world, and art making, performance, became that. In Cage, now representing the sophisticated remove of imagination, invention over reality, I could take shelter from the social structure I was born into. This remove restated the siren song of the 60s counterculture declaration. This is a time of transformation. You are not your body. You are not this thing that has a meaning beyond your control, inscrutable in its past and terrifying in its future. You will be free if you declare yourself free. 
The only cost of this freedom is to cut yourself off from the straight world and any investments, influences, or entanglements it demands. At that time, the word straight, like so many other terms of common use today, was in flux. Earlier, I used the word discourse because discourse skirts the notion of art making as the pursuit of masterpieces and the glory, the immortality they are supposed to bestow. Discourse expands art practice into something broader, more democratic, a participation in a world of ideas. The question is, is my art changing? Cage, forward to a year from Monday, new lectures and writing. I use the term discourse in the way we have grown accustomed to describing certain social phenomena as movements. We speak of the labor movement, civil rights movement, the environmental movement, the countercultural movement, the women's movement, the gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender movement. Movement, as its name implies, is a phenomenon that progresses, has a direction, a past and a future. It is the practice of a group. There is no movement of one. In the context of art history, modernism is a movement with its foundation myths, its architects, its factions, its orthodoxies. As postmodern performer choreographer Steve Paxson once told me, its research branch that another time would have been called its avant-garde. Discourse is defined as a written or spoken communication or debate as a formal discussion of a topic in speech or writing. In this context of art, as I understand it, so is practice. By that night's performance in the Students' Common in Binghamton, Cage had already been creating since the 1930s and had established himself as a major force in the discourse around musical composition specifically and art making in general. Indeterminacy, the work I respond to in story time, had its first presentation in Brussels in 1958. I fixate on Cage as opposed to Marcel Duchamp, who is, could be argued made Cage's contribution possible because Cage, in his homespun, American way, unlike Duchamp, identified strongly with time-based art, music, and dance. Why not Merce Cunningham, a choreographer I have learned more from than any other, a great master who was, whose assimilation of Cage's ideas changed the landscape I was to walk into. In the spirit of candor, Merce is perhaps too close. His form, though much different from mine, is at once too familiar and yet too particular to withstand and become the idea of tonight's lecture. The personification of an idea rests more easily on the singular figure of John Cage, a theoretician, a lightning rod, a giver of permissions. I choose Cage because, as an icon, he is more able to absorb all the symbolism and significations I direct at this tradition I have labored so long to be part of. So let's say Cage is water, and Merce Cunningham, one of the wonderful beverages one might make of it. Culture is sometimes defined as the well-stocked mind 
By that definition, that night in the student commons, I suffered a severe deficit of culture. I was coming from what today would be called the working poor, agricultural workers from a farming community that, like so much of the company, like so much of the country, excuse me, was benefiting from the prosperity and optimism of the 50s and 60s. The culture we absorbed in my family recently transplanted from the South was standard American fare. TV, radio, magazines, all inflected by African-American folklore, religion, social rituals, such as entertaining ourselves with the new stereo player, the jukebox that at one point resided in our living room, play acting, dancing, and singing. The public school I had graduated from had the average mandatory curriculum in the arts, literature, required reading, Emily Dickinson, Robert Frost, Melville's Moby Dick, Mark Twain's Huckleberry Finn. It offered several varieties of sports, a good choral program, a high school band, and essential for me, a drama club. The opportunity to perform plays or musicals that might have recently been seen or revived on Broadway. Much has changed in my thinking since I decided to attempt story time. Now, having made the work, premiered it, and toured it, I am more aware than ever misapprehensions brought on by art historical narratives and my own participation in advancing them. Here I refer to my making of John Cage an icon of modernism. In fact, the icon of modernism. A description that should be shared with, I should say, in fact, the icon of mid-century New York modernist composers and rhetoricians. A description that should be shared with Morton Feldman, Christian Wolff, Earl Brown, and others. Historian, critic, writer, John Rockwell, during a searching dialogue we had, was adamant in correcting this misapprehension, reminding me that as far as reigning schools of modernism, there were at least three in the world, two of them in the US. There was the Darmstadt, Germany, post-Weber and post schoenberg school of atonality. There was the US version of this 12-tone group as represented by Milton Babbitt. And thirdly, the above-mentioned branch of the New York School as represented by Cage, Fellman, Wolf, et al., who were caught in a pitched battle for the mantle of truly advanced music composition with what Morton Feldman titled either the Princeton-Yale crowd or the academic avant-garde that Babbitt represented. <laughs> So I concede to John Rockwell that John Cage was but one voice. But to my thinking, he was the most singular one. Certainly not for the popularity of his compositions, for as judged by who is most played on the conscious stages of the world today, Morton Feldman would be that. But as judged by the influence his thoughts had and continue to have on generations of artists in many disciplines. We are not. Cage speaking of the Cunningham Company in this day from silence. So I can see that I have been making Cage into a sort of straw man, a stand-in for a school of thought and a culture that I did not understand well and that I felt excluded from. 
In speaking of story time, I often say that Cage's indeterminacy is both a comfort and a provocation to me. Let's take a moment to look at an important and controversial aspect of Cage's view on creation. First, he saw the act of composition, the execution of the composition, and the experience of the auditors, the audience, as separate activities. It is said that Cage places the author's intent or choices of presentation as a higher priority than the audience's capacity to interpret that intent. And here, the provocation. Sri Lanka, Sri Ramakrishna was once asked, why, if God is good, is there evil in the world? He said, in order to thicken the plot. Paraphrasing the question put to Sri Ramakrishna and the answer he gave, I would ask this. Why, if anything is possible, do we concern ourselves with history? In other words, with the sense of what is necessary to be done at a particular time. And I would answer, in order to thicken the plot. In this view, myself, a time described as, at times described as artiste engagé, that is, socially engaged artist with a highly emotional and expressionistic bent who places a high premium on spontaneity and improvisation while striving for success. Cage is claiming of the mantle of what is truly advanced, for example, most necessary, is a provocation. Leaving a show called Winter Paintings, I thought back some years when the Walker Art Center's then curator, Richard Flood, was walking us through the collection and we came upon an abstract expressionist painting by Joan Mitchell that was so striking, I asked Richard why it had taken so long for her to be recognized. He answered with a wry expression, it's the problem of beauty, Bill. A few days earlier, our friends, Cole and Dash, came to lunch at our home, and Dash said that, at this time, most visual art is conceptual. It's a way of thinking, she said. Comfort and provocation. The comfort is in the permission to please oneself first. Permission not to be understood. Permission even to be not liked. I finally saw Sleep No More, a performance by the Punch Drunk Theater Company. It is an inspired theater performance interactive event wherein a small army of actors, dancers, designers, and various facilitators provide a rambling, open-ended experience. A man, or was it a woman, informed us before we were let in, you will be directed but not told what you will experience and sentiment Cage would have applauded. We were led into an astonishingly, astonishingly complex warren of rooms and spaces of various dimensions and an incomprehensible number of carefully crafted installations. Much of the time it was dark, with a wondrous and ever-present sound design of ambient noise, ballads, and popular music from the first half of the 20th century. All spectators were required to wear masks and were instructed not to talk under any circumstance, creating an odd sense of anonymity and vulnerability that became more comfortable 
and even illuminating as time wore on. Some observations. As the event unfolded, one encountered various scenes between a number of attractive ensemble players. Often a performer would dash away to another location. This sudden movement pulled in its wake a school of masked spectators, sometimes literally running to keep up with the elusive player. Several times I tailed the group, and when I encountered a crossroad providing me the option of either following the crowd or venturing another course, I often chose to follow the crowd. At times, one was close enough to literally touch or see a performer thinking. It's in such moments one discovers a larger truth about theater, one that was challenged by certain modernist, postmodern choreographers and is still being examined today, and that is, what is artifice? What is the value of pretending? In Sleep No More, there came a moment when I stood in a group of maybe 20 masked spectators watching a woman at a small table eating. Truth was that we were all just a bunch of people Though, because the bulk of us were made invisible by our masked anonymity, this woman, this actor, was the only human among us revealed, and yet she was in character, shrouded in artifice and behaving as the only, quote, real human being, though she was herself pretending. Ah, so this is what theater is. The purpose of the above is to take me back to recognition of the creed I inherited from John Cage. Just as he is supposed to have encouraged Merce Cunningham to leave Martha Graham because, quote, that woman is becoming too literary. <laughs> For example, too much about acting, drama, and not enough about the elemental truth of the act of dancing. So Cage is known to have said he was not interested in symbolism because he preferred things be just what they are. The question is, what are things? During a snowstorm, Cecil Taylor, Arnie Zane, and I stepped into the blue note, shaking off the snow in the uncanny stillness of Sixth Avenue. Cecil introduced us to an array of personalities, some well-known, all lovers of jazz, and Abby Lincoln in particular, who sat quietly at the bar in between her sets. This was a treat Cecil had promised us earlier that evening. We had met at the insistence of Max Roach, who envisaged a collaboration between Cecil, himself, and the two of us for the Brooklyn Academy of Music's brand new Next Wave Festival. Meeting with Cecil, he had quickly dismissed Max as, quote, that old bebop drummer, and passionately insisted we consider Abby Lincoln instead as he was more than intrigued by her style and this thing she does, past words, past singing. He kept repeating, man, it's a sound she makes, a sound. John Cage is certainly my straw man. Myself, my creative self, struggles to connect to a way of thinking, the modernist discourse, and more precisely, the New York school John Cage became a leader of. Cage's body of work, and most importantly, the philosophy and practice that informs it, elicit a set of responses in me, a maker, who continues in Cage's wake. Listening to his text pieces is multi-focused in this regard. Yes, I am listening to the work, but I'm also encountering the individual. This individual specificity elicits a response as well, sometimes personal. December in the Casita. I decided that each afternoon I would do a minimum of two tasks, work on an upcoming address, and listen to one of an eight CD box set of John Cage reading, Diary, How to Change the World, It Will Only Make It Worse. <laughs> I resigned myself to allow the torrent of Cage's ideas, quotations, anecdotes, and isolated words to rush over my mind and ears. One day, a word made me stop the CD player, go back, and transcribe what I had just heard. The story was, Pia Gilbert, born in southern Germany, got into the taxi cab 
in New York City. The driver said, I am a black Muslim. She replied, I am sorry to hear it. You don't believe in the truth? That isn't the truth. You don't like Negroes? What makes you think I am not a Negro? And here, please join me as we step onto the slippery slope of identity. Tonight's lecture is titled, The Life of an Idea, Pastime. The life of an idea is, in fact, several questions nested uneasily together. There is the idea of a school of thought held within the idea of John Cage, man, artist, theoretician, nested in the idea of my idea of self, in the idea of an aesthetic discourse nested in a larger social discourse. Is there any benefit in describing Cage as a man, an individual? I believe there is. What are things, really? What of the self, really? Perhaps I'm a victim of our era's tsunami of relativism. By that I mean everyone today who sets out to prove an ultimate truth or provide the unassailable argument for a point of view will be challenged and ultimately humbled if not humiliated. We all remember a recent electoral season wherein one side accused the other of existing in a, quote, reality-based culture, now declared passé by their new old revelation of will to change reality or the inspiration of faith. We're all witness to the debate around global warming with a majority of eminent scientists and researchers saying it is real and a small, though potent group exerting a dismaying drag on the question by exploiting the media and encouraging many to denounce facts in favor of feeling, the need to feel they will never need to change. Perhaps it's my Southern Baptist infrastructure inherited from the exhortations of my mother and father, self-anointed black Yankees who traveled north in search of big money, hand-picking 100 pounds of potatoes at 12 cents a bag, as opposed to cutting cabbage in the South for less. Perhaps it is this economic optimism marinated in the euphoric rhetoric of the civil rights movement saying, we shall overcome. One of the earliest memories I have is literally standing between my dad's knees, probably tracing or sounding out on a road map Little Rock, well before I could actually read, or joining all the folk around the new TV set as fire hoses and dogs assaulted people that looked like us, and hearing those staring at the screen saying under their breath, Lord, Lord, y'all go on now, go on, to the tiny, soaked and terrorized black and white figures in this most harrowing dance performance. Perhaps it was the queasy-making slant on righteousness which encouraged my parents to congratulate an older brother, little more than a child, who had produced a shotgun to chase away the man from the electric company come to turn off the electricity and gas due to lack of payment one dreary late winter evening when they were still away at work. We ain't no thieves, said my father. It just ain't right to cut off our gas with a house full of children and it's cold outside. Perhaps all of the above is why it was such a heart-stopping relief to hear the music of the 60s declaring, we got a revolution, want a revolution. Got a revolution, want a revolution. Accompanied by images of giddy young people blithely dancing, protesting, claiming some old order was dead and that they, soon to be we, as I was, would join them, were in fact the times that were a change. Perhaps it was this that said it was okay to leave the sexual trajectory that had carried my family forever and take a white woman and then a white man into my arms, convinced I had every right to hold hands with her or him in public, willing to come to violence if challenged. You step over that line and motherfucker, you're gonna have to kill me. You're going to have to kill me. Perhaps all of the above willed me in my art to make larger, inclusive statements such as, 
If we all stand together naked on stage, we will have overcome. <laughs> what divides us? If we use a dance concert as an opportunity for a disparate group of individuals to create something and show it to the largest audience possible, we will have triumphed over the fear and doubt that divide us. If I am brave enough to reveal the most personal aspect of myself, then others will do the same, and what will result is something akin to the supplicant calling out in distress or joy to the congregation and the congregation, the community, returning a full-throated affirmation. We hear you. We're not afraid. We shall overcome. But I don't feel this so unequivocally at this time. I may feel it again, but not so strongly right now. I will go so, so far as to say all my efforts my ideas and my feelings are in question at this moment. Years ago, Center Driver, a brilliant woman, a former dancer in Paul Taylor's troupe, told me that John Cage had undergone a crisis in the 1940s, a sort of breakdown, wherein he could not make decisions, turning to Zen Buddhism and chance procedures instead. We now know that Center was off base and that Cage's crisis was something else, complex and real. It was both a personal crisis and a professional crisis. I would not say it was a crisis because he couldn't make choices, because he found himself in a situation where what he was doing wasn't working. That showed up in a couple of ways. One was his shift in emotion from Zina to White to Rasputin. So it was the breakdown of a marriage out of which he composed the perilous night, which is about when love goes wrong. I think that's his quote, or when romance becomes unhappy, or something like that. So it was the breakdown of his marriage, it was the war, and the onset of this Cold War period, and his questioning what was the value of being a composer in that kind of a world where there was unemployment, and there was so much social strife, and there was so much war. What, what good was it to be a composer to try and convey emotions? He thought there were quite enough emotions in the world all by themselves. It didn't need him. I don't know that it was a crisis of not being able to make choices, but realizing that the choices made may or may not be the right choices. So the choices themselves, or the idea of choices, were somehow arbitrary. He wanted to find something Laura Kuhn, director, John Cage Trust. So was I, am I, as I turned to indeterminacy and chance procedure and story time, in crisis? Difficult to say. On one hand, things are better than ever, both professionally and personally. I regularly receive support and accolades for my work. I have bifurcated my creative life. Bill T. Jones on his own dance company continues to exist and thrive. We have merged with the historic dance theater workshop, DTW, to form a new entity called New York Live Arts as a means of finding a permanent home and to support the mission of a venerable research center and safe haven for the untried and the unexposed in contemporary live arts, embodied research, contemporary dance performance. I have expended my creativity into the area of commercial theater and have been welcomed there. Still, with success comes sometimes crippling doubt, a stiff wind of criticism, sometimes simply malicious and calculated to undercut and destroy. I'm just recovering from depression. My dancer's body is retired, but the dancer's ego is often bereft. I believe here I'm describing my own internal mental emotional experience as sort of a field. This field is, I believe, where my work originates or certainly must struggle to be made. It can be described by the various voices that originate there. Most, if not all, the voices are me talking to myself. Others are personalities like thinkers, fellow creators, and critics who may or may not be actual persons. Sometimes they are aggregates, 
fictional, created entities that appear to me to be speaking to each other as if I were not there, or more painfully, as if I were a comatose patient in a hospital room over whom my caregivers and family are commiserating. The den is frightening. So yes, indeterminacy, story time, are refuge from all the above. In Cage's philosophy of indeterminacy, there is no such thing as error, only mistakes and ex expectation. Max Roach told of the day when Abby Lincoln and he were excitedly putting the finishing touches on a Thelonious Monk tune to which Abby had written lyrics. They were excited because Monk himself was to come by. He came, listened intently to their performance, whispered something into Abby's ear, and then left. Max asked Abby what Monk had said, and here, Max doing a perfect imitation of Monk's curiously gruff, gravelly speech whispered, next time, make a mistake. Human existence is, or at least might be, less troubling and more peaceful when individuals went about their daily lives expectations, only experiences and awareness. Ramakrishna. Expectations here must refer to aesthetics because when I try to reconcile Ramakrishna's advice encouraging us to go about our daily lives without expectations, it clashes with the expectation gleaned from experience in my parents' teachings that one must earn a living, stay out of jail, and be responsible for one's choices in all things. How did story time come about? At some point a few years ago, having produced with my associate director, Janet Wong, my dancers, and a loyal group of collaborators, on average, one or even two evening length works a year over a 10 year period. Revivals of work, some dating so far back as 30 years, participated in the cre creation of one off-Broadway and two successful Broadway shows and gearing up for a third, I decided to separate works made for the company from outside projects. I wanted to perform again myself as I had retired from dancing some five years earlier. My plan was to make something with and for my company of 10 dancers and something for myself. For myself, it was to be small scale, low key, crafted for art spaces or small theaters. It would not be about dancing as I had had knee surgery and back problems. It would be an opportunity to do what I love, sing and tell stories. More than fatigued with the ongoing need to sell tickets to stay vital in the dance touring world, this project would not aspire to be performed in the venues the company normally appear in. The work for myself became the work for the company causing much to change in scale, resources, resources, and presentation. Why? I suppose because that project held the most fascination for me, a condition that always drives the need to make something new, until that moment, at least. I had for some years been listening to Cage's 1978 recording of Indeterminacy to relax. His voice, the rambling, often peculiar subject matter, was a delightful respite. It suddenly struck me that I was full of stories of my own and didn't want to organize them with a preconceived structure or arc. I would read circa 70 one-minute long stories, randomly selected from a pool of 170 plus, while my dancers performed around me. Here was an opportunity to be direct and sincere while still able to float, as Roland Barthes is known to have said in the face of relentless requests for his position on almost everything. While inspired by indeterminacy, story time would be a system of my making which I could participate at a remove, like a spectator, but different in that I would never witness the result as a spectator does. The company would be given a broad menu of movement sequences ranging from those borrowed from works created almost 30 years ago to those created on the day of each performance. Because sequences were subjected to minute-long durations, some running longer than that, they can be and are 
joined differently as their order is selected by random.org as opposed to John Cage tossing of coins and consulting the I Ching. Get rid of the glue. Henry Cowell. Transitions are non-existent or abrupt, meaning each performer, myself included, must stay focused, alert, and infinitely adaptable. Through chance procedure, the structure remains ever fresh and challenging for the dancers, our lighting and stage crew, for Ted Coffey, our composer, for me, and for the audience. Terrifying and exciting. Indeterminacy and story time are a respite from a way of working. I had come through a very difficult several years of research and construction of a large public spectacle called Fondly Do We Hope, Fervently Do We Pray, and I was tired. And as I have said before, full doubt. I admit the struggle to craft a work like Fondly left me desiring a means to create past my limitations of memory and taste. Cage's work in general and indeterminacy in particular offered a welcomed, a welcomed new way forward. After all, I have always struggled with warring impulses. Freely expressed ephemeral improvised movement versus highly crafted often formal construction. Movement supported by music or text-based accompaniment versus movement existing in a noble silence. A type of performer creation that transcends the specificity of who is performing versus one in which the work that is performed is inseparable from who is performing. A type of work made all the more resonant and compelling due to the anonymity of its creator. Popular forms of music movement and performance versus high art forms requiring specialized knowledge for its construction and or appreciation. We keep connecting him with his work. Don't you see that he's a human being, whereas his work isn't? If, for instance, you decided to kick his work and him, you would, wouldn't you, have to perform two actions rather than a single one. The more he leaves his work, the more usable it becomes. Room in it for others. John Cage, How to Change the World, You Will Only Make It Worse. I have found a comfort and a provocation as well in the philosophy that led John Cage to indeterminacy, and I acknowledge that he never insisted that, as John Rockwell says, others become little cagettes in their creation. If our purpose is tonight to meditate on the life of an idea, in this case, Cage the man, an artist, theoretician, is the idea. He can be, as, a, as it were, a harsh mentor, giving permission on one hand, but stern and disapproving as well. The strength that comes from early, firmly established art practices is not present in the modern dance today. Insecure, not having any clear direction, the modern dancer is willing to compromise and to accept influences from other more rooted art patterns, enabling one to remark that certain dancers are either borrowing from or selling themselves to art. Others are learning from folk or oriental arts, and many are introducing into their work elements of the value or in an all out effort devoting themselves to it. Confronted with its history, its former power, its present insecurity, the realization is unavoidable that the strength of Modern dance once had was not in person, but was intimately connected with and ultimately depended on the personality and even the actual physical bodies of the individuals who imparted it. John Cage, Grace and Clarity, 1944. When Cage reads his wonderful one minute stories, they are plotted out by the second. As story time is very much a work in progress, Ted Coffey, my musical collaborator, has set some of my stories in such a frame, but for the most part, I intuit my reading of each story. I improvise my way through each minute. Chance operations are a discipline, and improvisation is rarely a discipline. Though at the present time, it's one of my concerns how to make improvisation a discipline. But then I mean doing something beyond the control of the ego. 
Improvisation is generally playing what you know, what you like, what you feel. For those feelings and likes are what Zen would like us to become free of. John Cage in Conversation with Stanley Kaufman, 1966. The wonder of Cage as an idea that is a man is that he can be so categorical and yet always exploratory and open. 20 years after the above quote, he said, if you have work to do that is suggested and not determined by a notation, if it's indeterminate, this simply means that you are able to supply the determination of certain things the composer has not determined. Opening the door to improvisation. But does it open the door to intention as opposed to non-intention? One of the most troubling but fruitful realities of story time was that no, the stories were not consistently arranged by random procedures. Some stories and some sequences were so important to me that they were given a certain pride of place nightly, complete with crafted lighting and even sound. Why? Because there was a feeling I had that I insisted on preserving and sharing with an audience. Having made this decision with the help of my associate director, Janet Wong, we were free to make the work that we felt necessary to make. And here I turn to my mentor, John Cage, who has said that the first importance to the composer is to find something new. I countered by saying that is certainly important, but just as important is that he finds something rather than original, authentic. I dreamed of the old house I grew up in on Miller Road. It was almost dark, and it might have been a Saturday night because the house was empty, peaceful. I was alone in the kitchen with my dad, much older than he would have been at that time. We sat quietly, me holding his hand, massaging it. I asked if that helped him. His eyes were sad and smiling. He said gently, that feels real good. My mother, Estella, died in the fall of 2002. Though she was to be buried near her mother, Anna, in the small town of Bunnell, Florida, the funeral service was held in Tampa. The service was the culmination of a week of grieving outbursts, negotiations, hurt feelings, and certainly laughter. However, when the minister, after a moving though perfunctory eulogy, said to us, Stella's children, y'all come say goodbye to your mama, everything changed. 10 out of 12 of us were present standing around the open coffin. I was sure this would be a purely public formality, even as I heard the low murmur of my siblings addressing our mother, each in a private voice. These quiet calls took on urgency close to hysteria as the coffin's lid was slowly closing. Some even tried to stop it. I felt secure in the role of observer until the wailing was joined by one more voice crying, pleading for more time to look, to touch. It was my voice. Take a moment. Does anyone want to talk, ask, complain? <laughs> I understand they have runners here. I would love to engage a couple of questions if you would like to. I see a lady 
his hand right there. You've spoken a lot about the ideas as coming from you. When you use the word discourse, do you think of the other side, like how the idea is heard or felt? Could you speak a little about well, that? Well, I think about it a lot. But do you understand what I was saying about John Cage's idea was that creation, execution, and audition or the spectator are different actions. And it was even said that he thought that creation was a more important concern than how it was actually heard. That is my engagement in another man's idea. I had a wonderful dinner tonight with the president and Eddie, other people from the faculty, and we talked all about a new musical I'm working on, Superfly the Musical. And we talked in really blank terms about how many times can you use the word nigger in a production and not offend. How do you make a film about a drug dealer, womanizer, appeal to middle class people, often many of them are women? We talked about those things. So if that's what you mean, thinking about the other side, there is that side which we as artists are not supposed to care about. Why not? Because of people like John Cage. We're not supposed to care because we're actually supposed to be dealing on another plane. Or are we crass and craven? we are concerned. I wanted to do the best speech I could tonight. I wanted you to feel certain things. Did I dare hope you would? You must not. And that is the rub, isn't it? Many of us performers not so evolved as Mr. Cage are hungry, needy human beings. I know that's a low blow. They aim at us a lot that we are misshapen children, needy, and that's why we're on stage doing it. <laughs> I think that's, sometimes that's true. It's, you know, we have what we call stage whores, you know? But a lot of us think that that is our spiritual action. Is this what you're asking? It is a discourse. But would I do it even if nobody liked it? 20 years ago, I would say, you bet you. Now, I don't know. I got a lot of the prizes. <laughs> so why? Why do I do the next one? Pure inquiry, says Robert Irwin. How's that answer, folks? <laughs> How's the BS factor? <laughs> Anybody else? You want to go home? Come on, come on, one more. Yes, ma'am. You know, I actually just want to ask you if you could talk a little bit more about that exquisite cameo that Abby Lincoln makes in your narrative. Mm -hmm. um, and, the you know, sound, the sound, sound the makes? sound that goes beyond words, which mm -hmm. is so often used to describe. Mm -hmm. Abby, especially at a particular moment in her career and with Max. And I wonder Max. what John Cage would think. A man who, That's right. you know, this fighting with the modern yeah. school was mm -hmm. harmony mm -hmm. versus sound. Yes. And I wonder what they thought of the way that Cecil Taylor used yes. the word sound. Yes. And the way John Cage says that his composition was about the exploration of bringing new sounds into the world right. or recontextualizing. Right. There's not much to say. I was, that night, I was taken with a quality in her voice. Mm -hmm. It was a voice that had, um, you know, she had been a very pretty woman. She had yes. been a beautiful woman. Right. Remember, was it The yes. Love of Ivy? Right, um, yeah, The Love of Ivy. But even before that, in The Girl Can't Help It, she had this previous career as a supper club singer. She was glamorous. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But you know, she wasn't taken seriously. Yep. She was all window dressing. Yep. And so by the time I saw her, mm -hmm. she was uh, very conscious of the way uh, how uh, Misia, a great Fado singer, a friend yes. of ours in, in Lisbon, told us mm -hmm. that the Fado singer, there comes a point mm -hmm. when the voice must, like a vessel, be cracked. Yes. So that the soul can get out. Mm -hmm. You know, very romantic, isn't yes. it? Yes. The price of that cracking is extreme. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. But if that's what you're asking, there was that sound, you know, mm -hmm. that ah, that she yes, made, right. you know. You know, another person said to me once, was it about Abby? I think she said, um, well, it was Maya Angelou. She said, you know what? She plays at being crazy. And if you play crazy, you're going to go crazy. <laughs> Pardon? Oh, that was Nina, yeah, was not that. That sounds Anne. like Nina. It sounds like Nina, doesn't it? So well, feel, forgive me, Abby, but there was something about the life that was romanticized, mm -hmm. the difficult life of a jazz singer. Yes. And with her, she got spectacular results very late in her life. Mm -hmm. Now, that was the sound. Would that have been the concern of John Cage, right. a scientist of sound? Yeah. I don't know if those schools have ever joined. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much and good night.